living life defeated, my spirit in the grave, stumbling in darkness, and shackled by my shame, aside from the struggle.
Good morning and welcome to Zion Online Worship on this Pentecost Sunday. Uh, the Sunday every year when churches from all over the world gather to celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on people from many tribes and tongues and nations on the day of Pentecost. So we just celebrate today God's goodness among us and his presence among us. And with that in mind, please receive God's greeting this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from Jesus our Lord, and from the Holy Spirit, God's living presence among us. Our call to worship this morning comes from Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God, they joined the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved.
Have you ever been so hungry that you've just had to have a snack before dinner even though you knew it was spoiling your appetite? Well, I had that happen to me two weeks ago. George Duma, who serves with our food bank and who delivers food from local grocery stores to help supply our food bank to help meet the need of the city, came to the church the other week and brought into my office this delicious looking muffin. It was a cranberry orange muffin. And it had been a long day and I was leaving the church and I was driving home and was ready for dinner. I was very hungry and I looked at the muffin on the seat. And regardless to say, George came in a couple days later to the church and asked how that muffin was and I said, it didn't even make it home. <laughs> I had devoured that muffin before my car even pulled in the driveway, um, after which I then made dinner. Now, I think of the phrase in the song that we just sang, cause your church to hunger for your ways. And I think, does our hunger as a church, as a body of Christ, as followers of Jesus, does our hunger for God's ways resemble that of a hunger of someone who just can't wait to get home and eat dinner, can't wait to the extent that they devour a muffin? Now, it makes me also think about Pentecost, about the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit descended on followers of Jesus, it empowered them 
to serve the kingdom of God. It filled them with this deep hunger to follow the ways of God, to be the church in the day and age that they were living in. Now, I think back to the words of the psalmist, David, who writes in Psalm 84, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. He says, My soul yearns, it even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young. A place near your altar. Lord Almighty, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Now, over the past several months, we haven't had the opportunity to gather in one place, like that passage that talked about the Spirit descending on the people of God who were together in one place. But one of the beautiful things about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is not limited based on the confines of our world, even the confines of ourselves. The Holy Spirit goes beyond that. We have to have a willing heart that says, Holy Spirit, come and meet me where I am. Fill me with a deep hunger to be in your presence so that I may serve you. And so today is Pentecost Sunday. It's a Sunday where we're not able to gather together in one place. But rest assured, we can know, we can have hope that the Holy Spirit is dwelling with us where we find ourselves this morning. The challenge, though, is are our hearts open and willing? Are we in that place where we are hungering to be in God's presence, where we are hungering for the ways of God, not just ourselves, but as a community, a church community that gathers together online, a church community that is called to live in relationship with other people and with the city that we live in. And so I invite you to pray with me this morning as we ask the Holy Spirit to enter our hearts, knowing that the Holy Spirit is here right now. Let's pray. Father God, you have sent your Spirit to be with us, to be in our hearts. But we confess that we are often unresponsive, for we are afraid. When your spirit speaks, we often turn deaf ears, for we fear what you might be calling us to do. When your spirit touches our lips, we often close our mouths, embarrassed to speak your word. When the wind of your spirit blows, how often we close the windows of our hearts because we are afraid that the breeze will disrupt our ordered, controlled lives. When the fire of your spirit touches us, we often quench the flame out of fear of the new life that it might bring. So Spirit of God, this morning in the world that we live in, filled with so much uncertainty. In a world that we're not quite sure what the future looks like, we give you the places of our hearts that have been overwhelmed by the worries of this world. We give you our tiredness, our sin, our struggles, our struggles with fear, and even apathy. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would enter our hearts and that you would change our hearts where they need changing. Make our souls willing to receive your breath of life. 
renew our hearts and make them whole where they feel broken. But most of all, cause us to hunger for your presence. Cause your church, cause us as your people, the church, to hunger for your ways. And help us to live as hope-filled people because of the power of Christ at work in us, because of the power of Christ at work in this world, this work of redeeming a creation, redeeming a world that you, as the creator, love. God, we recognize that in each of our own hearts, we may be developing that appetite. For honest, sometimes we look in our hearts and we confess that we are not hungry for you. And so God, increase the appetite in our souls. Help us to realize that that deep longing within our hearts is not a longing for control, a longing for normalcy, a longing for things to go back the way they were. It's a longing for presence. And God, you are present here with us. And so open our hearts and our minds and our souls to experience that presence this morning and beyond this morning, the presence that goes with us into our everyday lives. And so God, challenge us, renew us, and transform us by the power of your spirit. Thank you for being here with us and for filling us with hope. Amen.
Okay, so this morning we are going to start a four-week mini-series in Romans chapter 8, which is, I think, my favorite chapter in all of Scripture, Uh, certainly my favorite chapter in all of the New Testament. And we are going to focus in on the Holy Spirit, the theme and the topic of the Holy Spirit, for the next four weeks. So we are not just doing uh, Pentecost Sunday, Holy Spirit, Uh, We're going to do this for a month and look at the nature and the being and the work of the Holy Spirit from many different perspectives. And this is really actually also a response uh, from me to many of you who have talked to me about the Holy Spirit. Uh, People have brought this up with me over the past year from Zion and said, you know, I don't hear a lot of sermons throughout the years on the Holy Spirit. And I agree with that. Um, I haven't heard a lot of preaching on it throughout my life as a Christian. And so we're going to delve in for a month and we're just going to focus on the Spirit of God. And this morning, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give an overview of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit, uh, which is tied to Pentecost. So we are going to talk quite a bit about Pentecost this morning. And then I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction, and we're going to jump into Romans chapter 8. And I'm just going to focus on verses 1 to 11 in Romans chapter 8 this morning. So you can turn your Bible there. Uh, I'm not going to read from Romans 8 right now. I'm going to read from it in just a little bit. So turn to that passage. And when we get to Romans 8, we're going to focus on two things. We're going to focus on life and freedom in the Holy Spirit and the fact that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ and who are in the Spirit. So that is very good news to hear. Uh, We're going to hear that news this morning and rejoice in it. And as we jump into this today, uh, I want to start with prayer. And I just invite you to join with me and we're going to give this time and the next four weeks to the Spirit and ask for his leading. So Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence among us. We thank you that you are here. We thank you that you are with us in our homes, that you are with me here, uh, that you're with Michelle as she's here helping me to record this, Uh, Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are active and you are moving, and we just pray that you will speak to us today, that you will speak to us uh, this week, that you will speak to us in this month uh, about who you are and about what's on your heart and what you're leading us to do as we live in this very strange time that we live in today. So we thank you for your blessing And we just ask you to speak to our minds and hearts as we gather together and we worship and we get into the word. Amen. So in Christian theology, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. That's how we typically have referred to the Holy Spirit. And so there's a relationship here that is uh, triune. It's between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is spoken of in the Scriptures, whether it's in the Old Testament, in Hebrew, or it's in the New Testament, in Greek, uh, the word for spirit is actually uh, threefold. It's spirit, wind, or breath. And so throughout all of Scripture, when you see the word spirit, it could mean literally spirit, but it can also mean wind or breath. And so in the scriptures, uh, one of the most beautiful images that we have of God is that God is, it's the breath of God. And we see that right in the early parts of Genesis when God breathes life into Adam. It's that word, it's that spirit, breath of God. And the Spirit of God in Romans 8 is also referred to as the Spirit of Christ. So in Romans 8, as we will see, there's a Trinitarian picture of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And they are interacting, and they have always interacted together as one. And they interact with us in our lives individually and in community. 
So the Spirit is God's personal and loving presence in our lives. And Romans 5, chapter, chapter 5, verse 5, puts it this way. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us as a gift. And so by way of analogy, the Holy Spirit is like the mysterious power of love that is at work in relationships. That relational bonding agent, if you will, in relationships. Relationships between uh, spouses, relationships between parents and children, relationships between friends, and relationships between siblings. So God's Spirit is like that mysterious power that binds us in loving relationship with one another. So I hope that that analogy maybe helps you and it gives you a bit of a picture when you think of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's breath of love expressing itself from all eternity in the relationship of love between the Father and the Son. So the Spirit is that uh, agent that binds together the Father and Son relationally in love from all of eternity. Just an amazing thought. And the Holy Spirit is God's breath of love for us. His presence in us. His, his loving presence that unites us in Christ and in the Father and that unites us together as the body of Christ, as the church That's the Holy Spirit. And so from the beginning, the Holy Spirit has been present and active in creation and in the preservation of the universe itself. And we read Psalm 104, and it gives us a picture of that, the Holy Spirit working in creation and in preservation of all of creation. The Spirit was also brooding over the waters of creation. We see that in the second verse of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. And that is an image there of a a male bird covering the eggs, sitting in the nest and covering the eggs and protecting them and warming them. The Holy Spirit brooding over the waters of creation and then breathing life into the first human being the holy spirit in past ages the spirit was present with individuals and the spirit was present within the people of israel we see that in the old testament but it was a little bit sporadic it was certain individual people it was times when we see the the spirit was very active and very present Uh, but the holy spirit hadn't yet been poured out as the scripture says The universal blessing of the Holy Spirit had not come to all people and all nations, although God's Spirit was active in all nations. And the prophets spoke about this. I'm just going to read two verses from the book of Ezekiel, uh, the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 36 of that book, in verse 26 and 27, the prophet says this, I will give you a new heart, says the Lord your God. A new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and I will cause you to walk in my ways and be careful to obey my commands. So when the spirit comes... When the prophets spoke of that time when the Holy Spirit would be poured out on people from all nations, eventually, all peoples, all tongues, all tribes, from all over the world, when that great event happened, the Spirit would be that presence in us that would allow us, that would enable us to obey God, to follow God, to fulfill the law of God, in our lives. So really, it's the Holy Spirit is God's miraculous presence in us that allows us to follow God completely and fully. 
And so, at a fixed point in history, as the prophet said, God worked. And how did he work? He worked by sending his only begotten son, Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, to fulfill God's promise and his plan of salvation. And listen to what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, in John chapters 14 and 16. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you the Helper, the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. The Spirit of life and of truth, who will lead you in all truth. So Jesus echoes the teachings of the Old Testament prophets, and he says, this time has now come. And then, on the day of Pentecost, which we already heard read at the beginning of our worship service today, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection and 10 days after his ascension to the right hand of the Father in glory, the Holy Spirit was poured out initially on thousands of people who were gathered in the city of Jerusalem for the celebration of Pentecost. And what is Pentecost? Pentecost is also called the Feast of First Fruits. And the Jewish people celebrated this uh, festival for hundreds of years before this day, this, this event when the Spirit was poured out. And every single year during that festival, there would be people from many different nations who would make the pilgrimage and they would come to Jerusalem. At the time of year when the barley harvest had ended and the wheat harvest was ending, and they would celebrate, they would come and they would make offerings to God, sacrifices, and they would celebrate together God's great provision. And it's at that party that God pours out his Holy Spirit, announcing, and get this, the first fruit of the new creation. That the new creation is bursting forth within the old creation. So God takes this historical event, this celebration among the Jewish people, of his, within his promised people, where they are celebrating God's provision. And then the day of Pentecost, that day of celebration, when the Spirit comes, it is an announcement. It is a first announcement that God's salvation is coming out and, and flowing to all nations and all peoples. The floodgates of grace swing wide open on this day. The worldwide family of God is being established. The walls that once divided Jews from Gentiles, that once divided people from all tribes and nations, they are coming down and God's peace is declared. If anyone is in Christ, new creation proclaims the New Testament scriptures. And why? It is because of the event of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so, we come full circle back around to Romans chapter 8. And Romans chapter 8 is uh, a chapter that is entirely focused on the person and work of the Spirit. And we're going to take this in sections over the next four weeks, as I said at the beginning of my sermon. And today, we're just going to read through the, ver the first 11 verses of Romans 8. And this passage, uh, when we read it here, it it's like a flower coming into full bloom. Okay? So I want you to take some time to reflect on this passage this week outside of this sermon. Um, and once we read it, you're going to see that you need to do that. So verse 1 is the seed, if you will. So just catch this image in your mind right now. Verse 1 is the seed. And then verse 2 is the seed being planted into the ground. Then verses 3 and 4 
are the flower that begins to develop. Verses 5 to 8 are the flower expanding. And then verses 9 to 11 are the flower in full bloom and the fragrance is going out. So Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 11. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is the seed. There is the great proclamation that goes into the ground here. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So there is the seed going into the ground and being planted. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. That is the Jewish law. It was weakened by our sinful flesh. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, not according according to our old nature, our fallen nature in Adam, but according to the Spirit. And so here we see the flower starting to open. For those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, the old things. But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the things of the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and it is peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. And listen to this. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells within you. And so, here we see the flower coming into full bloom. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, is life because of righteousness in you. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the, from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. In you. And so now you can loop back around to verse 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because we have the Spirit of life which is in Christ Jesus. And so, even throughout life and at the end of life, we have the promise of true life in the Spirit and ultimately the promise of resurrection life. In God's new creation. So I mean really this is an amazing statement of the gospel in living color. There are many things that I could say uh, obviously about these verses. But I just want to focus on two things from here on in this message. And the first thing I want to focus on is that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the second thing that I want to focus on is related to it, which is that life and freedom comes in the Holy Spirit. So first, no condemnation. I'm sure that there are many of you out there who feel that you have done terrible things in this life. I know when I look back on my life, I feel that I've done terrible things. I'm sure that there are people out there as well who feel that terrible things have been done to you. Perhaps you blame yourself for the terrible things that you have done or 
you blame yourself or perhaps somebody else for the terrible things that have been done to you. I think that's our human condition. That's our common human experience. There's a brokenness, a deep brokenness there. But whatever your situation in life, whatever you've done in the past, whatever has been done to you in the past, whatever bad thing that you might be thinking about doing now or to someone else in the future, I want you to just hear this this morning. Hear this good news that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That is the good news. That is the gospel of grace. And it is for you and it is equally for everyone in this world, which relates back to the whole point of Pentecost that I was talking about. It's for all nations. It's for all people. The Spirit being poured out. It's for the poor and the needy everywhere in the world. It's for the self-righteous and the greedy everywhere in the world. The proud the famous, the outsiders, the gossips. It's for you, the unclean, the drunks and the addicts, the pimps and the prostitutes, the gospel of grace, the announcement, the truth, the good news that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. It is for you. For all of us, grace extends out to everyone. But please hear me on this this morning. Grace can only break through in our lives when we receive this good news. When we receive the Holy Spirit into our lives. It's, it, it can only be, become active for those who are willing to say, okay, God, I have messed up. Like, I've messed up my life. I've hurt other people. I've been hurt. I'm broken. I'm sinful. And I need Jesus. It's for the people who are willing to say, I need the Holy Spirit. I need the miracle in my life. God, I want to trade in my pride for your furious love, the furious love that you have for me that I see in Christ and the Spirit. It's for those people, the people that are willing to pray to Jesus and say, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I surrender. Holy Spirit, come flood my heart with God's love. It is, it is then when we, when we pray that prayer, when we begin to live that new life, that the Holy Spirit just comes in and floods us with grace. Where, when there's breakthroughs and when freedom, we experience real freedom in our lives, it's then when we invite God in, there is life and freedom in the Holy Spirit. So there is not only... A, a freedom from this feeling and this reality of condemnation. But there is the gift of life and freedom that we live into. There is a joy and there is a peace that comes to you experientially when the Holy Spirit comes in and indwells you. So I just want to stop here for a minute and say there, there are a lot of us myself included, I was just interacting with another uh, brother this week who said to me, you know, a lot of times my f I feel like my faith is up in my head. It, it's not focused on this experience of the Holy Spirit in my life and in my heart. And this morning, what, what this message is all about is that 
our, the Christian faith is not just all about a head game. It's not just about believing certain things and, and ticking certain boxes. I, I believe in the Trinity. I believe Jesus died for my sin. I believe that the Holy Spirit exists. Those are all great things. But this is focused, Romans 8 is focused on the fact that the Holy Spirit is living and active. It's God's transforming presence in your life. And we have to say, okay, God, I want this thing. I want you to be present in me. It's all about presence. And when we are transformed by the presence of God in our lives, we go out and we become a transforming presence in the world. Not because of how good we are, or not because of how many good things that we've done and we've, we've built up a whole list. No, no, no. It's because God is at work in us and he's leading us out to, to be that presence in the world for people, to serve people as Christ served. It's all about the living presence of the Holy Spirit in us. And so I want to draw your attention back to verse 2 in Romans chapter 8. It says, the law of the Spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So a, a, a transfer has happened here. We've gone from death to life, spiritually speaking. And then, in the end, physically, we will go from dying in this body to resurrection life in Christ. That's the full picture. So this verse is part of a line of thinking that goes throughout Romans from chapter 7 all the way to chapter 10. And we're kind of right here in the middle of things. And here it is. Those who are in Christ have been transformed and set free spiritually. We are new creations in Christ. That's the gift. If you, if you are not a Christian... Right now, if you are not a follower of Christ, if you haven't given your life over in, in that prayer and set out on that journey, this is what you need. For those of us who have, this is what we need to continue to do. We serve in the new life of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the flesh and of the law, because we can't fulfill God's law. We can't fulfill the natural law. We're screw-ups. That's who we are. We are fallen people. We mess up all the time. We fall and we have to get back up. We need God's grace in our lives. And so, God's holy and righteous and good law exposes the sin in our lives. Okay? But it is powerless to free us from that sin and to allow us to come into the freedom of the Holy Spirit. And that is why God sent his only begotten son. That's why God sent Christ as our substitute. He steps into our place and he makes us right with God. But that's not all that Jesus does. Jesus also, in unity with the Father, sends the Spirit into our lives. And this is the part that we often neglect in the church. This is the part of the story that isn't focused on a lot. All of God's promises are yes in Jesus. Absolutely. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's law. He is righteousness for us. Absolutely. A hundred percent. But the righteous requirement of the law, Romans 8 verses 4 to 6, is fulfilled in those who walk according to the Spirit of Christ, the one that he has sent, and who set their minds on the things of the Spirit. The text does not say who set their minds on the things of Christ. It could say that, absolutely, and it would be true. But it says those who set their minds on the Spirit the living presence of Christ in our lives. That's where the focus lies in the Christian life. God's Spirit, it indwells us. God's Spirit empowers us for holiness. 
God's Spirit empowers us to be able to follow Christ and to live in His ways. The Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of God's law in our lives. It's unbelievable. The Holy Spirit is what unites us in Christ. It is His presence and His work. The Holy Spirit blesses us with spiritual gifts so that we can go out and we can serve and we can bless other people. It's the Spirit. And so, the Christian life is all about presence. It is all about God's presence. And that's where we are going to land this morning, is with that word, presence. In this time of isolation and social distancing, I've been thinking a ton about presence. So a couple of weeks ago, I talked about uh, the issue of safety, you know, safetyism, how this has kind of taken over. Um, There's another word that I think really relates to this cultural moment, and it's presence. What does it mean to be present to one another in this time of isolation and distancing? And what does it mean to experience God's presence in this time? Because I I think that that's something that a lot of us are really struggling with, not least of all those who are perhaps elderly and who are just literally stuck at home. My heart goes out. You know, people who, have, who are pregnant, women who are pregnant, people who have babies and little children, and they feel they're, they're afraid to leave home. What does it mean to experience God's presence and to be present with other people, not just our immediate nuclear family, but with other people in this time, to be present with the church. You know, this is something that we, we lament. I mean, I can't speak for you, but this is something that I lament deeply in my heart, is that we can't meet together like we used to and be present together because it was there that we, we encountered the encouragement and the presence of the Holy Spirit so often. It's why we love it so much being together. And the temptation for many people will be to further retreat and isolation, not to connectivity with people as we move forward. That's a real temptation. But to be the church is to be the healing presence of God in the world. Please hear me. To be the church is is to be the healing presence of the Holy Spirit to the world. That's part of our core identity as the people of God, is presence, God with us and us with others. And so what does that look like now? And I want to share a story as I end today that really just put this into living color for me this week. So myself and my family, my wife and my two kids, my my son and my daughter, we often go for walks, um, and uh, it was a beautiful day. Uh, we, my, my wife, Julie, and my daughter, Georgia, we were walking down a sidewalk in our subdivision. And, um, like, in, in some ways, it, like, it just even grieves my heart to, to share this and to go through this, but I, I'm never going to forget it. There, there was a couple uh, with two little tiny children, probably like one and three, and they came around the corner, and they were coming directly at us, and we were walking to them, and we were on the sidewalk. And so it's this precarious moment now uh, in our society where, it, you know, somebody's got to move. And you don't, it's not just one foot. You've got to move like six, eight, ten feet away. You've got to go onto the road, right, to get out of the way. And so the three of us kind of naturally just went to the side. 
And this young family, you know, they came walking down, and the mother and the father were nice. They smiled at us. Hey, how's it going? Whatever. And then I looked down at the three-year-old, and the mom and the dad, they were uh, pushing the two children on uh, little tiny bikes. And the little girl, I'll never forget her face, she looks at me, so I'm over here, and the father's there, and she looks over at me, and then she looks up at her daddy, and the only thing that she can say over and over and over is, uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. No other words. She's, she's terrified because there's people in front of her. She's three. She, she doesn't know any better. She can't, she can't comprehend. Her parents can't explain everything to her. She's just feeling something. And, and, and she's being formed. And she's being shaped. Her brain, her being is being shaped in terms of the presence of other people. And not in a positive way. What she, what's going through her mind? And think of the language here, okay? I already explained that the Holy Spirit, the w- words for the Holy Spirit are breath, not just spirit. What is this dear little child afraid of? She's afraid that in, in our lungs, in, in our bodies, there's an invisible virus that we will literally breathe out and she might get sick and her family might get sick, and someone might die. That's what she's afraid of. And all that she can say is, "Uh uh-oh, because she has no more vocabulary for it. There's no more understanding, but she's being formed. And that's the part where I am just in this place of lament and grief and questions. How, God? What, What do we do with this? What are the implications of this? There's all these little children all over the place in our, in our world, not just in our society, who are feeling this, who are being impacted in this way. The fear that a healthy family that you encounter on the road could be a deadly threat because of breath. Church, what God has put on my heart is a question on this Pentecost Sunday, 2020. What does it mean to be present with one another? In this time. What does it mean. To experience. God's presence. In this time. What. What is it. That God is calling us to. And we need each other. To answer that question. You know, I, I can't answer that question myself. I'm not asking these questions for fun today. I'm asking these questions seriously. What does this mean? What is God doing in our time? I hope you realize that God is shaking the foundations of our society right now. He's shaking them. And he wants to reshape us into a people who experiences his presence, not not just in terms of going to church and religion and all of the things that people have experienced, because that's out the window. 
This is about experiencing him in this time. And the challenge that he is putting to us is, church, what does it mean for you to connect with people, especially people who are in real need right now? All of us. Not just people like me who are are a paid pastor or the staff of a church. Everybody. The bride of Christ. You. What does it mean? Because the church exists to be God's ever-present blessing to the world. The church, we, the body of Christ, we exist to be God's ever-present blessing to the world. That's part of the question. It's part of the answer as well that God's drawing us into. What does it look like for you? What does it look like for me? What does it look like for us? Hopefully we are going to be able to continue to explore this and unpack this in the next three weeks. But for now, would you please pray with me? Holy Spirit, breath of the living God, fall afresh on us. Lord, we have very few answers to big questions. But we desire your presence. That's what we desire. We desire that we would be overcome with your presence so that we could be your blessing to this world. I pray that for your church worldwide on this day of Pentecost. Spirit poured out 2,000 years ago. We've experienced, Lord, outpourings of the Spirit throughout history. May this be another time. We pray that it will be another time of awakening, of an outpouring of your Spirit, of transformation of people's lives. Not just church and religion, but the transformation of our lives, Lord, for your glory and to your honor. Come Holy Spirit. Amen.
his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and grant you peace. Amen.